Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, this session on uh, climate change effects on groundwater resilience regarding uh, pollution and remediation. Uh, my name is uh, Tibor Stichter, and I come from you. Uh, I come to you from IHE Delft in the Netherlands, and I'm chairing this session with my dear colleague Dinesh Zuizu, who is associate professor at the Eduardo Mondlane University um, in Mozambique. So uh, thank you for joining, Dinesh. Um, and Denise will be helping me today with collecting uh, all your questions to the speakers. Uh, and we invite you to submit those questions through the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will address most of your questions, we hope, during this session, uh, after your, the talks and at the end in the plenary. We, but we might not have time to, to answer to all your questions verbally. Uh, so um, we will definitely aim to collect uh, written responses to all your questions. So please do not hesitate to, um, to write down all, all the questions you have for the speakers. Um, with, and with that, um, I would like to uh, move to the program of this, uh, of this session. It includes six exciting uh, presentations. Uh, and they are, of course, around this theme of pollution and remediation. Uh, under climate change uh, for groundwater. And we know, of course, that let's say with the exception of geogenic contamination, uh, groundwater pollution is um, largely caused by human activities, but it is our interest to understand how contaminant fate, for instance, is further affected under climate change. And also what kind of nice uh, new monitoring and modeling tools there are to help us understand these processes. And for instance, also to look at the potential of adaptation solutions, such as managed aquifer recharge um, for remediation. Um, and uh, we have the honor actually to start the session uh, with, a, well, with a reference in this field, uh, a world-renowned speaker, John, John Cherry. Uh, John is an associate director of the G360 Institute for Groundwater Research in Guelph, in Canada. He's also a junk professor of the University of Guelph of Gelf and um, distinguished professor emer uh, emeritus at the University of Waterloo. Uh, of course, we also all know um, John very well because of um, well winning the prestigious Stockholm Water uh, Award, a water prize this year, thanks to his pioneering work in, um, in the field of contaminant hydrogeology. Um, and John, I know today you'll be talking about the importance of passive approaches for groundwater remediation uh, in the context of climate change, and that you have prepared this presentation with yet another uh, renowned scientist and a uh, great colleague, Beth Parker, who is also the director of the G360 Institute. So with this, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you, Tibor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, present to this uh, a wide ranging meeting on climate change. Uh, my colleague Beth Parker and I normally, of course, speak to audiences who are only interested in groundwater contamination, but getting into the broader context of climate change uh, is most important. And this is our first uh, attempt at uh, such a talk. Um, it's a pleasure to make this presentation with my colleague Beth Parker and I. And uh, next slide, we'll try and explain. Uh, the title uh, of our talk, which will be the goal. And as we all know, groundwater makes up 99% of all liquid fresh water. Uh, but unfortunately, the amount of water available for use at any given time is small. So we're in a global water crisis now due to the combination of groundwater uh, depletion and uh, groundwater pollution. And it's rare that we encounter a problem where these two things aren't uh, involved in, in important interplay. Next. In the era of climate change and population expansion, the goal for sustainable remediation is to reduce risks from pollution while minimizing depletion and aquifer disruption. Next. Uh, this is uh, kind of in one slide, the story of groundwater contamination with a North American uh, emphasis. I took my first classes on groundwater contamination in 1965 and began research on the topic in 1968. So I've kind of traveled uh, from the front of this arrow to the end. And over the decades, at least in the North American context, it seems that each decade we've got a new crisis contaminant. Uh, the focus here, of course, is mostly in point source contamination. Um, and I suppose the lesson here is that society seems to have learned nothing uh, from these decade uh, frequent uh, contamination crises 
preventing contamination in a major way is not what's uh, happened. Next, please. Uh, remediation has been applied at thousands of sites uh, without site closure, uh, with wastage of much uh, money and water. And site closure, the way the terminology is used, we mean that we've cleaned up the aquifer enough so that the part of the aquifer that was contaminated can be reused. Uh, Beth and I are advocating that this definition for site closure is not a practical one and causes lots of wastage of resources. Next slide. Uh, what we know now, after decades of experience then, is clean up the background rarely is rarely accomplished due to source zone conditions, such as bean apple, dense non-aqueous phase liquid and back diffusion. Pristine groundwater is rare in aquifers. Anthropogenic chemicals are nearly everywhere. Therefore, we should be selective about what we attempt to clean up because groundwater in active aquifers is more or less like lakes and rivers. Uh, there's one type of contamination or another present and we have to look at all of them uh, in their totality. Next slide, please. So there's a common prem premise, uh, contaminated groundwater sites should be cleaned up by aggressive actions to prevent the contamination from spreading. But within this premise, basically, uh, the idea is that you should clean up so that you can reuse the part of the aquifer that's contaminated. We're proposing an alternative premise. Contaminated groundwater should be appropriately delineated and risk to pre present and potential receptors determined. Many contaminated sites do not have enough relative risk to warrant remediation. Avoidance of spreading may be necessary in some cases and passive remediation options need priority. Uh, next slide, please. So active versus passive remediation. Active remediation involves continuous inputs of energy and engineering activity, whereas passive remediation involves infrequent inputs of energy or substrates to stimulate uh, degradation, uh, one-time engineered option up front, uh, passive reaction barriers, for example, and natural attenuation involves no energy or uh, no engineering activity, just monitoring. Next slide, please. Now, there's a concept that's commonly used in air pollution and uh, river pollution, which is assimilation capacity. The groundwater has a large assimilation capacity, but of course not enough when we excessively load the system. But nevertheless, we want to uh, bring to the fore this concept, concept of assimilation capacity in the groundwater context. Next slide, please. So assimilation or attenuation takes place uh, according to uh, a number of interacting processes. And what we found in our decades of, of study of actual contaminated sites is that if you look at the site over the long term, not months, not years, but decades, these processes tend to become much more effective uh, and that can be used in the decision-making process. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll start with a, with a case history. Uh, in uh, 1993, this was front page news in Southern Ontario and Toronto and Cambridge, which is an hour's drive from uh, Toronto, and it's a pesticide contamination site that was discovered uh, fortuitously, and the site is in the midst of a bunch of water supply wells for the city of Cambridge, 100,000 people. Next slide, please. Lots of, lots of panic, people fearing uh, uh, cancer from, uh, from the metallochlor. Uh, the site is situated in an industrial uh, area uh, with uh, wells uh, surrounding it. Next slide, please. And uh, this shows the plume um, that uh, got going, uh, presumably when the plant uh, uh, opened in 1980. Uh, contaminants uh, didn't arrive in the nearest well, uh, G6, until 2001. But what was really fortunate was that when they did arrive, it was at a microgram per liter. Uh, the drinking water limit is 50. So the arrival and all, uh, all following concentrations then were well below the drinking water limit. So in essence, this plume is there. It's occupying part of the aquifer, um, but it's not doing harm. Next slide, please. And uh, this uh, plume has been studied by Beth Parker and his, her colleagues for nearly 25 years. It's, it's like being a member of the family. Um, the plume doesn't change from year to year. Uh, and as we see it now, it's, it's slightly diminishing uh, in its concentration. 
Next slide, please. This shows detailed monitoring along a cross section of through the foam. Uh, each one of those dots is a monitoring point. So although uh, expensive active remediation by pump and treat or whatever was not, uh, did not occur, um, the cost of doing all of these studies was well above $10 million. So we're not saying that you uh, get away with not doing anything by spending very little money. In any case, you invest the money in understanding the system so that good decisions can be made. Next slide, please. Now, this is a schematic of what we find or expect is happening at many contaminated sites on fractured sedimentary rock. The plume gets going and over a few years or a decade or two, it reaches a maximum extent. Uh, and then compared to that maximum extent, it starts to shrink. And we believe over many decades, many of these plumes will be shrinking away uh, to much something much smaller than their original state. So to actively remediate uh, these types of plumes when there's no significant receptor uh, would be uh, misguided, which is common. Next slide. So the Cambridge case study showed that uh, passive, a massive pump and treat system that was employed uh, to remove contaminants would have been a waste. Um, uh, and um, monitoring has shown that this uh, would have been a waste of energy and would have caused large uh, aquifer disturbance. Now, what's generally not realized that many efforts at, uh, at uh, groundwater uh, pollution remediation cause aquifer disturbance. Which, uh, is, which causes unintended consequences, uh, in many cases, uh, very negative. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another high profile site and continues to be a high profile site just outside of Los Angeles that uh, Beth and I have been involved in, in for uh, more than 20 years. Um, next slide, please. It's the Santa Susana Field Laboratory uh, near San Fernando Valley. Uh, this view was taken back in the 90s when this was a, a major uh, site uh, being used to uh, uh, test uh, and develop rocket engines. Next slide. This shows a, a old rusting rocket engine test uh, stand uh, and it gives you a general perspective on the terrain. Sandstone, fractured sandstone, and their faults, et cetera. So it's a fairly complicated hydrogeological uh, situation. Trichloroethylene was used to clean the rocket engine test uh, areas after they were used. Next slide, please. Uh, the bottom uh, left slide shows this transect approach where you uh, take a cross section across the plume and drill a bunch of holes and do a bunch of sampling so that you understand the plume. At this site, each hole would probably cost a half a million dollars. And the amount of money then spent studying plumes at this site has greatly exceeded, you know, it's in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, these plumes are now very well understood and we know that none of them are reaching any receptors or doing any harm. Next slide, please. And there's enough data to do modeling using discrete fracture network model. And if we look at the simulation results, um, which are based on uh, field uh, comparisons, the difference between the plume at 50 years and 100 years is relatively small. So the plumes have gone to a near stable condition and that's with no degradation. If we add a little bit of degradation, which is what we think is happening, then the plumes have gone to stability. Next slide, please. Uh, the upper slide shows the field uh, results and the lower slide shows what we get when we put the field results in the context of, of the model, a very good comparison. Um, the conclusion being here that we know enough about this plume, uh, these plumes to warrant to basically doing nothing but very good monitoring off into the future to make sure that we're right. Next slide, please. However, the decision here by the regulatory agencies is, has been to push for uh, lots of pump and treat. On the right, we see a map of the entire site it shows 14 pumping wells that have been going now for two years. Uh, this is public relations uh, remediation, so that people feel that something positive is being done, uh, given that there's a, a basic uh, distrust in, in scientific predictions. In this case, then, in an area where groundwater is very valuable, groundwater is being treated at great cost and being pumped back into the aquifer. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a uh, slide is constituted in, in more of a, a, a porous media context. 
uh, through the center of the schematic plume, we have a long set, long sect, uh, a longitudinal cross section. And the lower slide then shows a plot of a CR for C uh, zero. But uh, anyway, I can continue. So we'll go to the case study of plume in a sand and gravel aquifer. Do you have that up on the screen? Um, and so this shows a plume uh, from a dry cleaner of uh, perchloroethylene going into a river. Um, and the next slide then shows how it's been monitored in detail. The plume goes uh, into the river, uh, but basically you can't detect it in the river. Uh, next slide, please. But if you uh, sample the river bottom, uh, half a meter below the, the water uh, sediment context, then you can see that the perchloroethylene is transformed into a variety of other degradation products. Uh, the water quality in the stream bed then is worse than the original plume by degradation. However, none of this shows up in the river. So our conclusion then is yes, the river bed in a very small area is impacted, uh, but the river is not. The next slide showing many plumes. Um, so this next slide then schematically shows a plume going into a river, uh, but, um, but the plume in, in the river in many cases, as I mentioned, is non-detectable. And we would consider this then to be part of the overall assimilation capacity of the entire system. Um, next slide. Transect approach for determining contaminant plume mass discharge. As I mentioned, we put cross sections across these plumes. And if you measure the concentrations in detail uh, and you uh, uh, know the uh, flow rate, then you can calculate the, the contaminant mass discharge. Next slide. Angus site. So the Angus site, like many plumes in Santa Gravel aquifers, has high concentration zones. Um, but when you actually convert the concentrations with groundwater flow into discharge, in this case, uh, the load to the river is less than a few kilograms per year. Very insignificant, although the concentrations are relatively high. Next slide, key points. Mass discharge or flux is a better measure of impact to receptors and concentration. At first glance, all of these plumes were perceived to as high risk contaminant plumes because of high concentrations, but because of natural attenuation processes, i.e. simulation capacity, the actual impact receptors were never realized. Next slide. Um, this slide shows um, some results that we obtained in, in Southern California for, for recharge over four or 500 years. The zones of yellow are droughts. Um, and we can see that if we go back more than 100 years or so, we've had droughts in Southern California that in fact are much longer than the droughts that we've been hearing about in the last few decades. In other words, climate change is coming at us with a vengeance in the form of droughts which will make groundwater quantity uh, very important. Uh, uh, and we can't go about our present approach to remediation by wasting water when our groundwater is gonna become so uh, valuable. Next slide, please. So basically unnecessary disturbance of groundwater systems and wastage of pump water should be scrutinized. Climate change combined with a thirst for water and the need to feed an expanding population must become governing and uh, groundwater is needed for bio, to prevent biodiversity decline uh, with less groundwater ecosystem availability. Uh, my comments here are all related to point sources and in later talks in this session, people will be talking about distributed sources, which are also very important. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, uh, we do have uh, some time for questions, so I'm turning it over to my dear colleague, Dinesh. Uh, I'm sure, uh, um, did you find any interesting question on, on the Q&A box uh, that you could start with? Well, thank you, Timbo. John, I think you only have probably two main comments that are coming up uh, from this one is from Darius Gezu. And um, here the question is uh, how, how does climate change affect groundwater quality? Or will that the climate change affect groundwater quality significantly? And then we have another question by Enrique Fernandez. And the question is, uh, is whether, uh, uh, to what extent 
to manage Africa research in their solution to pollution. Is the mission a real opportunity to handle the gas measure technique change? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go with those two. Yeah. Um, of course, there's another comment that someone on was asking me, so I'm not sure if we bring that on as well. It's related to the software or program that we use to simulate the problem. Thanks, Nish. If you, I'm not sure. Yeah, given the, the quality of the sound was a bit, uh, a bit low, but uh, um, I can pack that climate change adds to what you have mentioned now, uh, uh, some of these natural attenuation systems, how are they affected by climate change? And the other question was how MAR, managed aqua recharge, if you think it can be a solution, um, to further reduce pollution levels. Yeah, so manage aqua recharge uh, needs to be um, basically very high in the priority of how we manage groundwater. Uh, and and uh, much of the water that goes into the ground then will be contaminated to some degree. So one of the big challenges, as I understand it, to manage aqua for recharge is to get the, the water quality parts of it sorted out. Um, but if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to avoid yeah. after depletion, we've got to have MAR uh, in a big way. Okay, thank you. And uh, a brief question, a brief answer, sorry, on the on this. What do you think under might happen under climate change to to these systems? Um, well, un under natural under, attenuation in in areas where climate change is going to cause drought. Um, then there's going to be less recharge and therefore less water passing through the system. Uh, I think we would expect then that the, everything would become more sluggish. Um, and in some cases that may actually improve the ability of the plume to, to ameliorate itself. And in other cases, it may be negative. So that'll be very aquifer specific, I think, uh, as will be most of the impacts yeah. from the change. Some cases worse, some cases better when it comes to plume health. Thanks, John. Um, there will be more time for some questions at the end of the plenary uh, of the of the talks. Uh, I have also got some questions, but uh, we can discuss them later. It's really interesting to understand this passive approach of monitoring, which can also be itself, as you said, very quite costly, um, but but uh, sometimes is a better alternative than directly going to to treatment, which is also very expensive for certain substances. We will move on. Um, that Thank you for, to our next uh, speaker. Um, please, uh, Walid Chmengi or, uh, from the National Research Institute for Rural Engineering, Water and Forestry in Tunisia. Um, and your talk will be on pharmaceutical active compounds in groundwater, contamination and related risks on the reclaimed water reuse in agriculture. So please, Walid, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure to present uh, recent uh, results on the occurrence of uh, pharmaceuticals active compounds in uh, water uh, resources uh, in the context of the reuse of treated waste water for irrigation in Tunisia. Next, please. Uh, my country, Tunisia, is uh, facing uh, water scarcity because of uh, the limited available water resources compared to the high uh, demand. Agriculture is uh, consuming more than 83% of the water resources provided uh, partially by uh, groundwater, uh, by the groundwater in uh, coastal areas. Uh, consequently, these uh, aquifers are increasingly contaminated by uh, anthropogenic uh, and uh, agricultural activities. Next, please. Uh, so groundwater is, was particularly affected in uh, Nabel region by uh, sea water intrusion. Uh, treated wastewater has become uh, the unique uh, available water resource. Uh, despite the high number of uh, studies uh, on the impact of uh, the reuse of treated wastewater on the groundwater, only a few studies have uh, addressed the occurrence of uh, emerging uh, contaminant uh, like uh, pharmaceuticals compound. So in order to address uh, this issue, 
uh, water samples were uh, collected from the area of uh, Oued Suhil, irrigated uh, with the treated wastewater for more than uh, 35 years. Uh, as marked on the map uh, from the two wastewater treatment plant, uh, SE3 and uh, SE4, and uh, from uh, four uh, farm wells, namely P1, P2, P3, and P4, in uh, June, uh, in April, and uh, June in 2017 and in 2018. So what are quality parameters were determined and uh, the analysis of uh, pharmaceuticals was uh, performed by LCMS. Next, please. So as uh, you can see in these uh, diagrams, uh, the analysis of uh, treated wastewater showed that uh, total suspend uh, solid COD and BOD for uh, treated wastewater collected from SE3 that was not uh, comply with the, the Tunisian standard for use in agriculture. Uh, due to the overload uh, of the wastewater treatment plant and uh, the discharge of uh, effluents uh, from hospitals and uh, tourism. Uh, main whale uh, treated wastewater samples collected from SE4 are within the threshold values uh, of the Tunisian standard. Next, please. Uh, concerning uh, groundwater, as I mentioned before, it's affected by sea water intrusion. So as you can see on the graph, uh, the electrical conductivity varies from 4.4 uh, for uh, P1 to 7.6 millisiemens per centimeter for P4 uh, from the upstream to the downstream. Uh, the value, the high values of uh, nitrate confirm also the impact of agriculture activities uh, due to the overuse uh, of uh, fertilizers. And uh, according to uh, the FAO recommendation, uh, the use of uh, groundwater for irrigation in the uh, wet Sahil area should uh, obey to uh, moderate to severe restrictions. However, farmers are uh, still using uh, groundwater for irrigation despite the clear ban, uh, which may affect uh, soil and uh, plants. Next, please. Now let's move to the second part uh, dedicated to the analysis of uh, pharmaceuticals active compounds. As you can see, we started uh, by uh, screening of uh, pharmaceuticals in groundwater and uh, treated wastewater, which uh, allowed the identification of uh, 13 compounds uh, with uh, random uh, occurrence. And uh, for the first time, we found an anti-cancer and the metabolite of cocaine on, in ground uh, water, which was uh, unexpected. Next, please. So out uh, of the 13 compounds, we selected uh, three, three compounds for quantification, namely ofloxacin, uh, caffeine, and uh, carbamazepine. Uh, these compounds have been uh, detected in all treated wastewater samples in uh, 2017 and 2018. And uh, as you can see, the concentrations of uh, pharmaceuticals in samples collected from SC3 were higher than uh, those uh, detected uh, in samples from SC4, probably because SC3 is receiving uh, more uh, effluence from uh, hospitals and uh, hotels without uh, pre-treatment. Uh, the issue is uh, if it's not used for uh, irrigation, uh, this treated wastewater is uh, discharged in uh, the receiving water bodies. Uh, therefore, it's relevant to calculate the hazard quotients. And uh, as you can uh, see, uh, treated wastewater has a high ecological risk, especially with regards to uh, ofloxacin and uh, carbamazepine. Next, please. 
Uh, the three target uh, compounds were uh, detected also in groundwater in the range of uh, nanogram to microgram per liter, uh, which uh, implies uh, a high infiltration of uh, treated wastewater to the groundwater. So for uh, Oflux has seen since uh, it's used uh, in human and veterinary purposes, uh, its source can be both uh, the application of uh, organic uh, manure or uh, and uh, the irrigation of uh, with uh, treated waste uh, water. Uh, finally, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, carbamazepine and uh, caffeine were not uh, completely degraded during uh, infiltration into soil and they are indicators of uh, contamination with uh, treated waste uh, water. Next, please. So to summarize, uh, there is clear evidence uh, that the agricultural practices like uh, surface irrigation and uh, fertilization enhance uh, the infiltration of pollutant to groundwater that is used for irrigation. And uh, the current uh, practice of irrigation with uh, treated wastewater of low, low quality is uh, unsafe, causing uh, sanitary risk uh, for farmers and uh, consumers of illegally irrigated uh, crops. And of course, uh, in addition of uh, a high environmental uh, risk. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Persistent antibiotics in uh, treated wastewater could be transferred after use uh, to uh, soil, plants, and the groundwater, uh, which can uh, facilitate the proliferation of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, and uh, this topic uh, is worth investigation in uh, this area. Last slide, please. So before concluding, I would like to thank the scientific committee for this for this opportunity and acknowledge the support of the research team at the Hydrosciences Montpellier France and Inergref Tunisia. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Walid. Uh, thank you for staying uh, just within time. And uh, any questions coming up, uh, we'll uh, we'll deal with them uh, in the in the plenary session at the end. Um, and it's nice to make the bridge towards the next talk, which also ta looks at uh, uh, certain micropollutants. And this is the talk by Josep Maspla from the Catalan Institute for Water Research um, at the University of Girona in Spain. And uh, your talk will be on the expected effects of future hydrological uh, uh, water balances on the antibiotic and ARG occurrence in groundwater. So I look forward to hear what, what that is actually, the ARG. In particular. Josep, please, the floor is yours. Okay, I was just reading your table for your kind introduction and good afternoon to all the people that's listening, attending this session. Indeed, my talk is uh, it goes on the line of my previous uh, colleague, uh, Professor Walid from Tunisia, and we are going to talk about the, the processes, the hydrological processes that control the movement of uh, these micropollutants, in particular antibiotics, and also uh, micro, micro, the microbiome and the resistome that can age in the same wells. Next slide, please. Uh, that's a, a reset that was conducted in the Mediterranean coast in northern Catalonia, uh, uh, where a, a previous study of about uh, 50 wells in this aquifer, that's uh, more or less uh, 35, 40 kilometers square, showed that, I mean, they are antibiotics, is a factor of three to the groundwater pollution. And after looking at the data that showed no special correlation at all, we decided to sample uh, uh, eight or ten uh, sampling points, uh, groundwater sampling points, for uh, a year and uh, at a monthly rate. So we have a, a temporal uh, series of what's going on about the antibiotic concentration as well as the microbial uh, characteristics of these wells during this entire year. In this area, I mean, uh, several compounds appear from, with concentration that goes from a few hundreds of nanograms to a few nanograms per liter. And the most uh, usual ones are uh, uh, quinolones, fluoroquinolones, and sulfanamides. Next, please. 
Uh, this is small, uh, that's definitely small, I know, but what I wanted to show you is that uh, for uh, the most common antibiotics found in this uh, yearly long uh, sampling uh, program, only a few of them appear only quite continuously in the, in the records. For example, sulfometaxamol and ofloxacin appear, uh, which are here in the left side of the graph, appear quite continuously. So for metoxafol appear more or less in all the wells at every campaign, whereas of ofloxacin appeared in most of the wells, but only in the first semester on the survey. Other antibiotics appear some uh, randomly, uh, sparsely in the data set, and we can see that there is no temporal continuity and there is no, uh, at the same time, a special continuity in the in their appearance of the in the field site. Next slide, please. So in order to understand what was going on with this uh, sparse uh, distribution of antibiotics on time, I mean, we went to, of course, to uh, hydrogeochemical analysis or hydrological, uh, hydrogeological analysis of, of what, what is going on based on hydrochemistry and also on isotopic data. Uh, here I will only show the isotopic data because it was uh, a neat correlation between the rainfall isotopes and the ones we found in groundwater. I didn't say that, but this is an alluvial aquifer. It's more or less uh, 15 meters thick, and uh, it's fully, fully pine of water. I mean, uh, the, the water table is just a few meters below the surface, so there is no water shortage here. And in the left-hand side, in the large plot, where it says groundwater and rainfall data, we see that the white diamonds that belong to the rainfall, they have a very heavy or very uh, low isotopic values. Whereas the main groundwater, those, uh, those symbols that are in color, appear concentrated in a, in a very, uh, very, very uh, narrow range. But the most important thing is that the small graph that's on the left-hand side uh, shows that uh, there is a temporal seasonal distribution of the water isotopes in rainfall. Uh, meaning having a maximum, a maximum uh, value in July and August and a minimum value that's about uh, 10 per mil difference in March and April. And if we go to the, if we go to the, to the right hand side plots, the ones that show the evolution in groundwater for the wells we were sampling for all this year, it looks like that the, it looks like that the, the uh, topic distribution more or, less, more or less seems the same declining path from uh, the month of highest values to the lows of lower values. That means that uh, using this data, uh, next please. So we proposed the hydrogeochemical hypothesis uh, about the, uh, the occurrence of some antibiotics quite continuously and others that appear sparsely in the groundwater record. Understanding that most of them came from uh, fertilization, from the use of uh, swine manure for fertilization, we understand that they came into groundwater, they go through the soil zone, and some of them only appear when there is a highly effective recharge during the uh, wetted season in this area. That makes that this uh, value that will be case A will appear sparsely and discontinuously following only this main rainfall event, while others, the one that uh, has a more, uh, more continuous concentration, and therefore we can talk about some kind of background concentration, are already included in the groundwater flow. Because both contaminants are reactive and they undergo structure and degradation, uh, it is our hypothesis that, that those have that has a low uh, partition coefficient values will belong to those that appear in the background, that, as for example, uh, sulfur metoxazole. Whereas other, the quinolones, which has a larger distribution coefficients, will be retained in the soil and then appear only when this is uh, intensive, a small event, uh, uh, excuse me, this intensive recharge events takes place. Next slide, please. If we go to the microbiome, uh, we don't see, uh, this is a intended canonical analysis of the samples for each well and at the four seasons that we uh, sampled this, this aquifer, okay? 
And we see that the communities, the bacterial communities, they tend to join with the well. I mean, there's a local influence and we don't see that around the aquifer, the, the communities are quite similar. They are, I mean, they are quite site specific, let's say nearby well specific, and therefore there is not much, uh, not, not much uh, similarity around the aquifer. If you go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, when we plot the antibiotic resistant genes for different antibiotics in this uh, principal coordination analysis, and we decide, uh, we plot them, depending if the wells belong uh, or located near farms, which will be a kind of point dilution, or, or that belong uh, in uh, agricultural areas, nearby agricultural areas where there are no farms, so that will be some kind of diffusion or distributed pollution. We see that the, the most common, the most common occurrence of antibiotic resistant genes tend to be located on those wells that belong to farms. Therefore, uh, we can say, okay, we have a, a kind of pollution that somehow from the microbiome and resistome point of view is more dependent on the, on the, on the characteristics in the vicinity of the well than in the hydrological flux around the aquifer. So there is a difference between what happens between the antibiotics that may produce this uh, uh, resist resistance genes in the microbiome and the appearance in the aquifer. And we go to the conclusions. You will show the next one, please. So some final remarks is that what I already said, the antibiotics we can be controlled by the hydrodynamics of the system, while antibiotic resistant genes will not. So, what does this, uh, how does this relate to climate change? I mean, what we want to show is that the occurrence of some, uh, excuse me, yes, thanks. The occurrence of some antibiotics depend on uh, extremely rainfall events. That means that if uh, recharge is going to decrease, perhaps these antibiotics that uh, only enter when there is an uh, extreme recharge will be retained in the soil and they will not be found in the aquifers at all, or at least in a minor proportion. Therefore, I mean, uh, climate change predictions also say, also say that the intensity of the rainfall events will increase with time uh, uh, in the future. So, on the other side, uh, we may have an extra, an extra uh, entrance of these antibiotics in the aquifer. Therefore, climate change will add more uncertainty of the way that we sample this uh, uh, uncertainty on how we find these antibiotics and our way to sample them, and of course, to have a faithful representation of the distribution in the aquifer. And finally, and five seconds more, uh, I, I apologize for this, uh, about the, the, the microbial communities and the antibiotic resistant genes that will be even more site-specific than the, than the antibiotics that produce them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, interesting, and also how to link that to, to John's talk on passive uh, remediation, right? Understanding how long it will uh, be in the soil and if we need to remove it uh, prior to, uh, to leaching, let's say. Uh, we need to move on, and I know you are, have no time to rest because you're going to speak on behalf of the first author, of uh, the next talk. Um, so um, that will be on uh, the governance and groundwater modeling, yeah, sure. uh, addressing governance gaps on nitrate pollution. So we go from perhaps a point source to a kind of more diffuse source. Uh, and uh, please um, go ahead, Joseph. Okay, thank you, Taiwan, again. Yes, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a word that has done with Italian people. And they apologize for not uh, having the, the option of being here today. So I contributed with that study and I will present it. And the idea was that, I mean, uh, when we go to the nitrate pollution problem and we face it in the future, that has to be resolved uh, using governance uh, processes. We found that, uh, the, can we go to the next slide, please? We found that, uh, and do it again, do it again, <laughs> and next. Okay. 
we found an analysis of nitrate distribution, and more importantly, the trend of the nitrate concentration in the aquifers in the Lombardy Plain in northern Italy, in some places that were declared the vulnerable zones, uh, those trends were growing up. And that's against the, the European Groundwater Directive, and therefore, some thing has to be done. But on the same time, if you want to approach the problem of nitrate pollution from a governance point of view, uh, next, please, then we we'll have to, uh, to, to be sure that some principles of the water governance processes are accomplished. And one of them is to collect data, to provide an evaluation of this data, and show them how these systems work. I mean, in the meaning that it's not only intuitively, and our experience on governance, I mean, the authors of this paper are expert in governance, they, they say that, of course, many of the of the opinions or the ideas that will hold over the governance process come from an intuitive analysis of data and information. And therefore, the water modeling can provide, I mean, an objective tool about which, I mean, this data, these processes, and more importantly, the hydro geological processes or the geological dynamics of the aquifer can be, uh, can be uh, explained and therefore provided to the actors, to the, to the stakeholders to get more uh, convenient decisions about what to do. Next slide, please. And then uh, we'll see that doing this, doing this process, I mean, our, the goal of this presentation is to show how the groundwater flow and transport medical models can uh, fulfill the information gaps and the capacity gaps that are uh, inherent to all governance processes. Let's go to the next, please. Another one, please. Okay, uh, the study area is located in the Lombardy Plain, uh, east from the city of Milano. It has an upper aquifer, a lower aquifer, uh, which is, a, I mean, a multi-layer aquifer with about uh, more than uh, 150 meters thick. And let's go to the next, please. And I think that linked the modeling process to the governance actions is that the model terms that we put into the model, I mean, can be discretized in a way that include human actions as well as they, they include the climate predictions. When we model, one of the terms you have to include is the recharge. And the recharge is given by the, the net recharge at the end, is given by the precipitation, by the, by the evapotranspiration when it's calculated, which cannot be, uh, cannot be, uh, let's say, uh, governed by men, they're natural, and they will change because of climate change. But then there are other terms as super water irrigation and groundwater irrigation, which represent some disturbance of the, all the hydrological system. And these are the terms that also influence the groundwater dynamics, but at the same time provide, I mean, all the agricultural benefits and all the agricultural activities and uh, whatever wellness in this region. Let's go to the next, please. So when using groundwater models, and here we see the nitrogen mass balance in all this aquifer in the study area, we see that in the right-hand side that the observed and simulated concentrations were not as bad, and that most of the residuals fit in the interval between 10 and minus, uh, minus 10 milligram liter. One important thing we can tell to the stakeholders is how the nitrogen distributes. And if we do a mass balance in the soil, and then using the groundwater models, a mass balance in the aquifer, we see where all this nitrogen that has been applied as a, as a fertilizer goes on. And we see that about the 90th and 90, excuse me, 29% goes into the aquifer as a surplus fertilization. This, this 29% represents about the 67% of the aquifer nitrate recharge. And that most of it goes out from fontanil, which are natural or artificial springs in the upper aquifer, or goes back to the rivers and flows out from the aquifer as surface recharge. Of course, this has a, a environmental values. And if the governance process has to protect all these environmental uh, values and environmental uh, factors, knowing where the nitrogen goes is quite interesting because uh, we know where to focus our actions and where to invest money, the money that we need to solve for the environmental problems. Understanding that the nitrate pollution of aquifer is an environmental as well as a political problem. So, 
there were the models, if all the stakeholders agree on them, agree on the input data, they will provide an interesting backcasting exercise where you can say, okay, I will take these actions and my, my mass balance will change in this percentage. So that means that we go, go, can go to the next, please. That means that if we know the precipitation changes, for example, the precipitation anomaly as plotted in the, in the left hand side, we can introduce this in the model and considering different actions, as for example, the irrigation rate from surface water, from groundwater, the fertilization rate using weather nitrogen uh, in different parts of the aquifer, we can get a different, uh, a different uh, mass balance that at the end will leave us how all these nutrients distribute along the system, how land is protected with environmental values, and what is the success in which you have managed the crops, the livestock, and the manure that comes from this livestock uh, raising. So models, at our understanding, provides a, a nice uh, stance as, an, as a nice tool that may include actions that can be changed through political or governance rules with those that depends on climate events forecasted for the future. Let's go to the next. So as final remarks, uh, in our exercise here in the Lombardy, I mean, we saw that, uh, that models really permit doing this backcasting exercise. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing that we found is that most of the data, I mean, fertilization, uh, uh, excuse me, irrigation data, all of them are given at a monthly basis. I mean, the municipalities and the administration has this data at a monthly basis. That means that for a modeling uh, time period perspective, it's quite a good value. It's a good uh, time step in, in modeling terms to be used in the or modeling period, to be used in the, in the model. Meaning that, I mean, when we, we, we want to, to provide data to the stakeholders, models will really, really help to get them objective values and not rely on some intuitive understanding on how the, on how the system works. And this finally fill the information and capacity gaps that are inherent to all these governance processes and that we found that uh, most of the stakeholders really, really need to go through them and overcome them really soon. Okay, I will finish here. I thank you for your attention again. Thanks. Thank you uh, a lot, uh, Joseph. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, very nice uh, this talk. Uh, also wondering to what degree you were able to to validate some of your model results, and uh, we'll come back to that uh, if time allows in the Q and A session. Um, and uh, I will also ask the speakers to have a look later at the at some of the questions that are very specific and that can be um, um, re responded to um, written. So we move on uh, to the next presentation for now. Uh, and I would like to welcome uh, Felix, Felix Ortmeier to, uh, to, to the stage. Uh, Felix, you're from the Ruhr Universität Bochum uh, here nearby uh, in Germany, uh, nearby the border with the Netherlands and your work uh, on the projection of groundwater nitrate evolution. So a very nice bridge with the, with the previous uh, uh, talk nitrate evolution under different climate scenarios in Northwestern Germany. So uh, please, Felix. Okay, thank you. So hello, hello everyone. I want to present uh, about uh, projections of groundwater nitrate evolution under different climate scenarios in Northwest Germany. Next, please. So first of all, um, climate change effects must to be taken into account in investigating future nitrate concentration. And therefore, we use climate projection forecast for the different climate scenarios for simulating future, uh, the future water balances. And with this, um, uh, the evolution of nitrate concentration is simulated based on the expected climate scenarios RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. Next, please. Here you see um, the study area. It is located in Northwest Germany, um, nearby Mönchengladbach. 
Um, it is a water catchment called, called uh, Lotshof. It is a quaternary aquifer with production wells in the north. And the flow direction is nearly from south uh, to north. And we divided uh, the study area in a thousand times thousand meter cells and um, orientated the cells by the flow direction. And then um, every uh, cell is assigned a specific nitrate input and degradation capacity. And um, land use factors are determined according to the crop types by Allen et al. and Urbanizes area after Zang et al. Next one. Here is a one dimensional scheme of the hydrological setup. Um, again, uh, the cells uh, divided and uh, the um, uh, study area is limited by no flow boundaries at the bottom, the bottom of the aquifer and on the side, uh, they are uh, limited by uh, the catchment area. And we calculate the actual evapotranspiration after source rate by using uh, the land use factors and then the um, recharge, uh, it is uh, the precipitation minus actual evapotranspiration times the area. Uh, the um, recharge goes into the cells and flows to the next cells. And with this water balance and with uh, nitrate input and the degradation capacity, we can calculate um, the nitrate concentration um, for every cell based on uh, Thoman and Müller. Next, please. Coming to the results, um, here you see um, uh, the water balances, um, um, the temperature, precipitation, evapotranspiration, and recharge um, for the ne next 80 years. Um, and for time periods for 2020, 2050, 2075, and 2099. And we see that the RCP uh, 4.5 presents a very positive scenar scenario because temperature isn't increasing much, the, re uh, the precipitation increases a lot, okay, the evapotranspiration increased too, but all in all, the recharge is very high. On the other side, uh, RCP uh, 8.5 uh, shows a strong decrease in groundwater recharge because the temperature increased a lot and then also the evapotranspiration is increasing a lot, um, precipitation decrease and um, then the recharge is very less. And finally, RCP 2.6 decreases similar but increases in the last period. So the precipitation increase and then also the recharge is increasing. Next slide, please. Here is a uh, present groundwater, uh, yeah, groundwater nitrate concentration. So in the north, uh, low concentrations, and in the south, very high concentrations. And on the next uh, figure, um, there are the is, is there is the evolution of nitrate concentration for the different climate scenarios, and again for the time periods, and we can see that nitrate concentration is increasing in every. Um, climate scenario, but the most in 8.5. And on the next figure um, is the total nitrate mass of the whole study area. And um, you can see, for example, 8.5 is increasing by nearly 90%. Um, 2.6 is um, first increasing and then decreasing like the water balances. And uh, 4.5 shows uh, the best uh, way, but is increasing uh, by 50% too. Next slide, please. This is another calculation. Um, here we reduced the nitrate input by uh, 20%. You can see that the increase is less, but it is, uh, um, yeah, the, the limit value of 50 milligram um, is um, still exceeded in some areas. And on the next figure, again, you see the total mass uh, of the whole study area. Um, it is increasing, and um, but it is uh, less increased by 20%. Okay, next, please. Um, okay, coming to the conclusion, um, analysis of the down, uh, downscale climate projection showed a large variability of potential effects on the future water balance. And therefore, a, a rising nitrate mass in the water catchment Lotso 
uh, by a factor between 1.5 to 1.8.9 uh, is expected as a result of climate change. It is not expected that a 20% reduction in nitrate input will uh, ensure uh, that the limit value is not exceeded. And we, ex uh, we expect that we can transfer these findings to another aquifers, uh, maybe to the whole uh, climate region. And finally, uniform measures for the entire region or uh, countries are not the strategy to solve nitrate problem. I aquifer or site-specific solution are required. Next, please. So finally, I want to thank uh, Rupp Research School for the financial support and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Felix. Um, maybe uh, as time allows, I can uh, go to my colleague, Dinesh, uh, and see, I think there's a question posted in the Q&A. I also see there was a, apparently somebody uh, had an issue with the screen sharing, but I'm not sure if that is a local problem or a general problem. Uh, Denise, maybe you can help us uh, with the question and with that issue, if that, that is a, a wider spread in the in the chat box, in the in the question and answer. Yeah, thank you. So, Felix, there is a question from Marwan. Uh, can you get me? Yes, we can get you very well. Uh, his question, his question is on your assumptions regarding nitrate. How can you justify the nitrate concentration average each square kilometer in regard to different stratigraphy and structure in the study area? And then we have a, but maybe just stick to that. We just take one question for now. Yeah. So, I, so, so I, I didn't get it. Sorry. Um, why can we what? So you have, av you have average concentration values of nitrate for each yeah. square kilometer. Yeah. Uh, the, the question from Marwan is how can you uh, explain this assumption also in relation to the different stratigraphy in the stretch in the study area? Uh, okay. How do you the, take the average? The stratigra stratigraphy doesn't change a lot. So it's uh, only um, um, quaternary aquifer and it's uh, yeah, really the same. And what about okay. the size of the pixel that you have one square kilometer? Yes, um, <laughs> it's, it's one square column. Uh, yeah, I, so the question, I guess, is uh, averaging on a square kilometer. Yeah, you need to choose a, a size, I guess. And and for that square kilometer, you, you, you consider it quite homogeneous, basically, in terms of, of the, uh, the input of nitrate. Yeah. Exactly. OK. I think that more or less covers the, mm -hmm. the, the question, indeed. Thanks, okay. uh, Felix. Uh, Again, uh, also have many questions that I will talk to you, uh, and maybe we have time in the in the question and answer session. Uh, it's a it was a really nice talk on, uh, yeah, seemingly this increase in nitrogen uh, nitrogen load, which seems somehow uh, independent from the climate scenarios, or at least not only dependent from climate scenarios. The, the load increasing in every scenario. Um, it brings us uh, to the to our last talk uh, by Teresa Teresa Leitão from the uh, Laboratório Nacional de Engenharia Civil. This is in Lisbon, uh, in Portugal, uh, my dear country to me, where I lived for many many years. Teresa, uh, you will talk about the precipitation pattern changes and uh, the impact on the groundwater quality in a specific aquifer near Lisbon, which is called Aluviões do Tejo. So, um, with no uh, further delay, please. Um, Go ahead, Teresa, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, I, I would like to start by thanking the organization for the opportunity of participating in such an interesting uh, uh, event. It's a pleasure to see again Tibor, a good friend and colleague. Uh, and my presentation uh, is about precipitation pattern changes impacting the groundwater quality. This was a work done by me and the colleagues there in the BINGO project, which was an Horizon 2020 project that was led by NEC. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, BINGO aim generally was to assess the impacts of climate change uh, in the integrated water cycle. But the study that I'm presenting now, it was um, our aim was to evaluate the potential impact of climate change 
in the groundwater quality. And we did that by evaluating pests, pest, the pests. I mean, we were uh, analyzing how did climate variability from the pest has affected groundwater quality in an alluvial aquifer. So instead of making projections uh, that we just saw, we were trying to see what happened in the past. Next, please. Uh, and for that purpose, we have um, uh, analyzed in the climate change scenario, we are expecting to have changes in precipitation, in evapotranspiration and temperature. And so we have uh, chosen a decade uh, from 2000 2009, where we have very clear changes in the uh, annual precipitation. So we had precipitation in the year 2004 and 5, as well as 2007 and 8, which were half of the average 600 millimeters precipitation. And we had one year, which was 2000, uh, 2001, with almost double. Next slide, please. Uh, and so our idea was uh, considering that the study area is an agriculture area. So we were expecting that the changes in the precipitation pattern and so the, uh, the, the recharge would, be, would have an impact in the nutrients leaching. So we have used to show you today uh, nitrogen, nitrates to evaluate changes in the nutrient leaching also electrical conductivity to have a more global uh, overview of the mineralogy and the chloride as a, a conservative element. And uh, uh, next, please. Um, we, we would also would like to share with you before jumping to the results, um, what were we expecting a priori from this analysis? So if we are in a, an agriculture area, and uh, if we don't consider changes in land cover or the fer uh, fertilization practices, uh, when we have less precipitation, we are expecting less recharge. And so if we have the same amount of fertilizers, what we would expect is to have more uh, nitrates. So we would have less dilution from precipitation. Also, if we have less precipitation, it's probable that uh, farmers irrigate more and the, the, the nitrate concentration in that irrigation water is higher than the natural recharge because water is pumped from the uh, local wells. And of course, the opposite would happen if we have more precipitation. However, these effects might, might have a delay in time because recharge is not, is not immediate. Uh, furthermore, in dry years, nitrate can be lower in the aquifer if we have less recharge, if groundwater is having uh, recharge from other area, uh, so the concentration would be lower. Next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, just to have a very quick overview of the site, so this is a bit north of Lisbon, it's an alluvial aquifer. Uh, we do 54 wells that we have analyzed. Next slide, please. Um, and if we look, um, we can see also the ever recharge uh, of the years 2000, 2009, and we can see clearly a big difference in one of the years that was a dry year, and you can see how it, uh, the difference over the region. Next, please. Um, and then uh, if we, make an analysis of all the data together, which is always uh, not so simple, we can, we can see a clear difference of the nitrogen uh, before the year 2004 and 5 compared to the next years. If we look at the precipitation line, we can see also that in the dry years of 2004 and 5 and the other one, we can have a a little bit lower nitrogen nitrate concentration um, when compared to the years. Uh, but this is not a clear pattern that we find here. Um, we, we see that after the dry year of 2004 and 5, we have some difference um, uh, in the next year. And could this be because nitrogen was retained in the soil? And then in the next year, when we have a normal precipitation, this was leachate further down to the aquifer. 
this could be a possibility. And um, in the 2007, eight, we cannot see this clear change. Next slide, please. And then if we take a, a closer look, again, please. Uh, if we take a closer look to um, uh, the overall area, we can see that in spring, which is all the graphics from or the figures from the left side, uh, in the several years that are analyzed, we have higher nitri nitrate concentration in spring. Um, and uh, this is due probably to um, leachate after uh, the winter season. Next, please. And uh, another time, please. Um, yeah, so if we take a look uh, to the results of one of the wells, uh, we can see 2004 and 5 as years with less nitrogen concentration. So it looks like the nitrogen is retained in the soil due to absence of recharge. Again, please, next slide. And uh, this next slide is about a set, a set of other, um, again, please, uh, yeah. Thank you. It's, a, it's about a set of other wells that were analyzed and we can more or less spot in the year for, uh, 2004 lower concentrations of nitrogen in most of them. So this probably uh, goes up with the theory that uh, probably nitrogen is retained in the soil. Again, please, next slide. So coming into conclusions, um, we cannot say that we see a clear pattern in water quality change. However, it looks like in the year 2004 and 5, we have lower concentrations of nitrogen. Um, also, I did not say, but during the period analyzed, there were some new rules established for the good code of good practices that have restricted uh, the, the use of fertilization. And this is not clear uh, by the opposite. Um, so we also know that the changes observed can result from several other factors than weather conditions. We have taken a look to changes in the land use. Uh, there were no significant changes in the, um, in the areas that are agriculture, but we did not take a look to the, the type of crops that might have changed. Um, next slide, please. So as an overall uh, final and trying to go now for the discussion, uh, I think that the main conclusion that we can draw, uh, draw from this uh, very brief analysis is that during the pe period of drought, the contaminants that might be introduced in the soil, they are retained in the soil horizon, eventually to be leached in the next period. So there is this time lag that depends on the piezometric level and permeability and all the factors that we all know. And so what I pose for questions now is what is really the potential that climate change have in the future of groundwater chemistry? For equivalent pressures and the same, the same contaminant levels, will we have the same contaminant levels reaching at different times? Will, will uh, more retention in the soil allow decreasing biodegradable compounds? Will particle retention, absorption, and contaminants increase because we have pollutants more time? Will anaerobic aerobic changes play a role? Will plants retain more fertilizers? And now time's up. Thank you for your attention. Perfect. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you again, all the speakers, for um, for your nice presentations and keeping uh, very well within time overall, which gives us a, a roughly a little less than ten minutes for uh, well for some questions uh, that are still uh, hanging out there. And Denise, I would like to hang hand over to you um, for those uh, for those questions. So uh, thank you, Tibor. Thank you to all speakers as well. Uh, we have a few questions that were posted, uh, um, and one of them is to is directed to Joseph Mas Plus. So the question is, uh, if you can explain the concept of temporal continuity as it relates to constituents shown in the graphs. Um, 
Uh, maybe um, we can, we also have another question uh, to to you that is related to your to, to your model. And the question is, uh, what is the technical and the political limitations to the model that you propose? Um, and, I mean, in the governance model that you propose. Yeah, uh, temporal continuity means that. Uh, that we expected somehow all these antibiotics to be uh, found more or less at every month we sample. I mean, you expect something and the, the reality is different. So we found that some of them, uh, yes, uh, like sulfamethoxafol, uh, happen at very often in most of the wells, while others did not. And that was related to these major recharge events which was uh, proved by the uh, similarity of the groundwater tritium was that of the rainfall. So if the water had the same isotopic tritium and, uh, and oxygen and deuterium uh, dotation had the same that, the, that of the rainfall, we assumed that that input of antibiotics in the subsurface was uh, almost uh, very close to the last uh, rainfall events. So uh, this continuity is broken because such uh, recharge events do not happen uh, many, very often. It happens only during the wet season in this area. Uh, I hope I answered. Thank you. Uh -huh. yes. Going back to the, to the political issues and uh, the acceptance of the model, I mean, we did that from academical point of view, uh, we conducted the model and then we realized that uh, in order that the model to be trusted in a governance process, it needed that all the stakeholders agree on the task of the modeler, meaning that the modeler should uh, be uh, honest in his work, as everybody, everybody does. But anyway, uh, he must be clear in the structure of the model, must be clear on the inputs, because the inputs may they came from different sources, and all the stakeholders may agree on the sources. And if everybody agrees on the model structure and on the input data, then the outcomes can be uh, fairly accepted and discussed in order to have some objective evaluation of what is going on in the aquifer. And from this backcasting exercise, then get some ideas of which actions will be actually beneficial for the environmental goals that must be rich, for example, uh, lowering nitrate the concentration trends, or for, for example, uh, irrigation goals, uh, crop production goals, it depends. A groundwater modeling that becomes a tool when all the data are properly and accepted for everybody put into the model uh, to provide an uh, objective uh, description of the behavior of the system. Thank you, Joseph. I talk a lot, but I think it's enough. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Joseph. Uh, very well <laughs> explained. You. Yeah, Denise. Yeah, we also have a question to Felix. I think it relates to the description of the aquifer that was his study. Um, the question is whether this was a sandstone or some other aquifer formation that he was uh, working on. Felix, did you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, it's, uh, it's a sand zone. It's a quaternary aquifer. Okay, then there was some also related question. Uh, it has to be with uh, the concentration of dissolved organic carbon in your groundwater. Do you have any data related to that? Um, yes, but I, I don't know in the moment. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, th I guess uh, the question was related to the relationship between that dissolved organic carbon and and uh, and nitrate in your system uh, and i think uh, well you would need to know those data to be able to um, understand that uh, to be able to answer that question is there another question to one of the panelists before i uh, state yeah, my general was, question uh, so there was one question to to Teresa Leitong. Mm -hmm. and i think one of the questions she already answered it had to do that was related to to the two droughts uh, that were experienced during the, over the period that she analyzed. I read the, I okay. read the question. Maybe you can uh, briefly repeat it, Teresa, the question itself and the answer. Yeah, the question was about, uh, because I talked about one of the years where we had drought and just uh, did not talk too much about the other year. 
And uh, what really happens, and this is why we had the conclusion, is that it seems that in all the years of 2004 and 5, we do, do have changes in the nitrate content, but we don't find these anymore in the, in the other year where we have the droughts. And uh, we assume that probably uh, there would have been more irrigation in that uh, second year, which had uh, helped to leach some of the nitrate that was existing. And probably in the first year of drought, this, this did not happen. But uh, okay. as I told, this is a quite simple study with a lot of other possibilities on the table that we did not uh, explore, but uh, uh, could you. explain these like changes in crops, etc. Yeah, thanks. Uh, time is almost up, but I would like to f finish with a final remark by, um, by our keynote by John. John, I hope you're hearing us. Um, my question would be, uh, as a general, we, we, we heard about um, antibiotics and nitrate. We didn't hear, for instance, about microplastics, which is also becoming more concerned. But to what degree do you think passive remediation uh, has that potential for these three types of uh, contaminants, antibiotics, nitrate itself, and, and microplastics? Point, point sources are so much easier to attempt to remediate because they're you know, you can, you can define their distribution. Um, things like nitrate, which are so distributed, it's kind of hard, hard to imagine, uh, you know, injecting organic matter or any of the things that are done for point sources uh, in, in such a distributed problem. Now, denitrification, you know, is happening, but, but not enough. And uh, I don't know anyone who's trying to actually you know, s stimulate the system with a little bit of stimulation, and then you let the passive stuff uh, take over. Maybe other people have have comments on mm -hmm. that. I mean, Thank basically, you, when it comes to nitrate, we need to change change how we eat. You know, when you get right down to it, if humanity wants to do something useful, that that's where the solution is. And yep. the beauty of nitrate is that it actually flushes out at a rate, you know, much faster than many of these other uh, contaminants. Definitely true. Uh, thanks. Um, millions, millions of things we could still talk about, but uh, time is unfortunately uh, uh, running out. And um, I would like to thank you, John, uh, and, and all the other speakers uh, very much for your, your dedicated uh, talks today. Um, for the audience, please don't forget that all this has been recorded and you can find it all uh, on the website tomorrow, uh, and that uh, there are also a few posters that are interesting and uh, that they're out there on the website. Um, and with this, uh, thank you once again, and um, we will see each other uh, tomorrow in the second session of this uh, thematic, uh, uh, of this theme on uh, contamination, which is uh, in the morning around 9.45. Um, so see you then, and thank you very much.